Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. As we begin our sermon this morning, we are in the, the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 8. We're going to read the whole chapter. It says, Now, concerning food offered to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. This knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. If anyone imagines that he knows something, does not yet know as he ought to know, but if anyone loves God, he is known by God. Therefore, as to eating of food offered to idols, we know that an idol has no real existence, and there is no God but one. For although there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things, and for whom is, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom we are all things, and through whom we exist. However, not all possess this knowledge, but some, through former association with idols, eat food as really offered to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. Food will not commend us to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat, and no better off if we do. But take care that this right of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if anyone sees you who have knowledge eating in an idol's temple, will not he become encouraged? If he is, if his conscience is weak, that eat food offered to idols. And so by your knowledge, this weak person is destroyed, the brother for whom Christ died. Thus sinning against your brothers and wounding their conscience when it is weak sin against Christ. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat, lest I make my brother stumble. Father God, we ask that you would speak to us today. We ask that you would speak to each of us every day. Father God, we ask that you would open our eyes that we may see your message clearly. Open our ears that we may hear your name. Father God, open our minds and give us understanding. Open our hearts that they're not only able, but that they are willing to receive the message you send us to it's in Jesus' holy name. Right. Paul is addressing the church at Corinth, and in the most most of this letter, Paul is addressing different types of the issues that, that the church at Corinth is, is having. And, and a lot of the issues are, are, are an issue of selfishness, selfishness of the belief. We, 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 we believe that Everybody is at the same point of maturity in our Christianity as we are. And often the case, that's simply, it's, it's simply not true. Everybody has their own understanding of the Lord's Word, and, and some are more mature than others. Some have better understanding than others. Some uh, have, think are more forgiven than others. But what's taking place is, Corinth is some of the the, the mature Christians are, are eating the food of idols. And basically, in, in Corinth, Corinth was a pagan town. It was a town where the people worshipped the gods. It wasn't a town of the one true God. So when, when the, the people come in and they, they uh, evangelized the town of Corinth, they converted many people who had grown up worshiping many gods and they had eaten and sacrificed to many other gods besides the one true God. And now that they had become saved, that they had heard about Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ had been sacrificed, that he had lived and died for their sins, and they had believed on him, that their understanding was they couldn't worship any other gods. So if anything dedicated or, or 
or given to another god that it was somehow it was bad for them that they, it would cause them to lose their salvation it would cause them to lose their faith in Christ and Paul, it, Paul, Paul is saying you know the food won't condemn you know, the food has nothing to do with your salvation those of you who know Christ probably already know that that, that it doesn't but the point is you're causing your brothers and sisters over here to stumble and fall because you're out here doing what you want. Uh, most of you know that I, I, I preach a lot about our actions and the things that we do. The things that we do as Christians are a reflection of where we are in our Christian life. The things that we do are a Christian are, it, they are our witness to a, a world that doesn't So, as Paul is talking about food and, and, and idol worship, he, he, he's more talking about our individual lifestyles that we are, we are leading. And the things that we can do because we can do them isn't necessarily the things that we should do for the benefit of everyone. He says, we know that an idol has no will to do. But there are idols. We know that there is one true God. But there are many things out in the world that people worship. Nowadays, you know, in, in, in this century, it's not about sacrificing an animal to a false god. But it's, it's more about uh, the major things in, in life like abortion or how much value you place on your material possessions how much how how things are important more so than people are important he, he says there is no God but one but there are many gods on earth there are many rules. Yet for us, there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist. You, you know, Jesus gave us a couple of commandments. And these two commandments, they sum up the whole law of God. He said, love God first. He said, love the neighbor. Now, how, how many of us as Christians place God in the number one position in our life? Before we set out to do whatever it is that we do, how many of us put God in the Now, a lot of us would like to say, yes, I do that, but in, in truth, we don't know we don't. We put ourselves we put how it's going to affect us or what it's going to do to, to us before we really think about God. I don't know. As a Christian, if you love God first and you love your neighbor, you kind of remove the self. If you think about what you're going to do today and how it's going to affect the immature Christian and more importantly how it's going to affect the sinner. If you if you love God first and you love your neighbor next, what if God had said in that scripture, "Love your neighbor like I have loved you"? Would you forgive your neighbor regardless of the things that they have done? Um, uh, 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 uh. You forgive them because that's what God does. Jesus, Jesus went to the cross and he lived. He gave up his life. He sacrificed himself as payment for your sin. You know, as a Christian, 
How many of you understand that as a Christian you are a sinner? You sin against God. And the difference between the Christian and the lost sinner, those out in the world, is that they don't realize that they sin against God. Or they don't care that they sin against God. The thing that makes us a, a Christian is that we have heard the Word of God and we have recognized in our brains that what God says not to do is a sin. If we do it, it's a sin. When God says don't do it and you do it, it's a sin. The difference between us and the world is the world looks around and says, well, so-and-so does it and so-and-so does it and so-and-so does it and we've got this many people doing it Therefore, it's okay, and it's not a sin. Well, no, that's not how God works. Sin is sin because God has been proven to sin. And you, and me, and we, as Christians, we recognize that we are sinners. We, we, when we realize that we sin, and that that sin is against God, we may not sin against our brother or sister. We may not sin against the sinner out there, but we sin against God. We recognize that and we're like, oh, I shouldn't have done that. And in our, our, our love for God, we recognize that it's wrong and we shouldn't do it anymore. And we say, God, I, I know I'm not supposed to do it. And I did it. And I'm sorry. I, I, I'm going to try not to do it anymore. And, and I may not succeed, and I need your help, and, and I, I love you, God, but, but you recognize it's a sin. And that recognition that it's a sin, and that confession to God is justification for God, righteousness for God, truth for God, love for God to say, That's what makes our God so holy. That makes that's what makes Him so full of truth and righteousness and love and mercy and grace is that He says if we recognize, if we confess our sin, He is faithful to forgive us. The world, they don't think they need to be forgiven. That's the that's the big difference. You know, as, as, a, as a Christian, you, you know it says in the Bible, Thou shalt not drink. Anybody read that? Say that. But if you go out and get drunk, and your neighbors see you getting drunk, you're acting just like the rest of the world, that means they can act just like the rest of the world. Therefore, if you can do it, I can do it. And it's not a sin. Your forgiveness isn't reason enough to make this life. He says in verse 7, However, not all people possess this knowledge, the knowledge of Jesus Christ. The reason that we exist, the reason that we are Christian, the reason that we are separated is because God has called us to live. He says, Not all possess this. But some, through their former associations, eat food as really often through an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. It's not the brain. That's important. It's the person. He says, in verse 9, he says, Take care that this right of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block. Just because I'm forgiven, I'm a believer in Jesus Christ, doesn't give me the right to go do whatever I want. Even though God will still forgive me if I do make this thing. God will forgive me as long as I recognize that I've, I've sinned against him and that 
sees you Have you ever seen a, 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 a have you ever seen an immature Christian that or a, a new Christian just recently been saved that started going to a church that that saw some of the, the other members of the church out out behaving worldly and, and that person in, in response to seeing that witnessing that and they went out and they started behaving worldly and then they got convicted in their, their consciousness that I've sinned against God and I've violated his, his trust in me and then all of a sudden they stopped coming to the church. And they stopped going around the, the Christian people and they just started possessing we in, in effect, we destroyed their faith. In, in your Christianity, in, in your profession, in your faith in Christ, how do you represent Christ? I'm not talking about trying to be a perfect woman. None of us. Third day, God raised him from the dead. Forty days later, he ascended into heaven with the Father. And now the world has us. sinning against your brothers and wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Let's go ask you who, who have you realized that you're saved? How many of you realize that you are Christian? That you're set apart. That just because the world does it, doesn't mean it's okay. No matter if there's 10 million people in our country that says it's okay, God says it's a sin. We as Christians work here to show the world that. It's not that we're better. It's not that we're better. believe that Jesus Christ lived in you. 
that he died to pay the price for your sins. Jesus is Father God, Lord Jesus Christ, Holy Spirit, as we come before you today, we do thank you for your word. We thank you for your truth. We thank you for your love, your mercy, your grace, your forgiveness. And Father God, we ask for strength. We love you first. We love our neighbors. It's in Jesus' name.